rent and offering, uh, we have a box set over there for the rent and offering for here, those here. You can do it online at NorCal Grace or at our PO box. Uh, the, sep the September trip uh, to Minnesota is set. Krista, you remind me. I I'm not going to stay as long as Krista. I'm coming <laughs> back for our church service. Uh, Krista's birthday is September 3rd. I said, I said we're getting back because her, her family likes to celebrate the birthdays. Her, her and her brother, his is in August, her is September 3rd. And uh, I said, we, we, we're usually not there so that they can do that for her. So I, I insisted. She doesn't care about it, but I insisted. But my wife's birthday, that's when we, we're going we're gonna to be there in Minnesota. Am I the 12th or you're, you're the 12th? I'm coming back on the 12th. You and Jada Lynn are staying later. Uh, so I'll be back on the 12th. So I'm, we're going to miss one Sunday, but um, that's when we're going to be there. And the Saints like to know, we're going we're gonna to have some type of Q&A that we're going to record and broadcast. So uh, we're still working out the details, but that's going to be on a Friday. We're going to do it on a Friday so people can come from work and, and spend. So whatever that Friday is, Friday 11. Oh, so it's the day before I leave. Oh, I'm going to have a late night and early morning. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, I'm a morning bear. That's fine. It, and I'll, I'll be with the Saints. So Friday, September 11th, and we'll, we'll give more detail as we work it out with, uh, with the brother. All right. Uh, Ryan, you want to do uh, you and Fernando? update on YouTube uh, <coughs> right so YouTube the YouTube channel of course like and share the videos and subscribe if you haven't subscribed it helps the algorithm helps people see the grace message online and we got the, the we should, in maybe a week or something we're gonna have yeah. the yeah, video the, mixer uh, yeah a week may, couple maybe a couple two, weeks yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're, getting, so we're getting closer and closer to having uh, YouTube live. There was a part we needed to, to, to make the live stream uh, operate and so right. forth, and Fernando yeah. secured it for us. Right. And if you'd like to give back, it's pretty, it was, it was a pretty expensive piece. If you appreciate the ministry, you can give back and say, um, we, we give this to, uh, yeah. towards the, the YouTube ministry. Yeah, yeah, you sure. can let us know. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, Subscribe Star is where Ron is uh, answering questions online. So I'm going to put the URL on the screen. And then also, it's going to be the number one link in the description below in the video. All right. Thank you all for that. Yeah. All right. We'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, turn with me, if you will, to Philippians chapter number two. Philippians chapter number two. We're looking at each book, each chapter uh, over the years. I've had favorite books uh, in my time in the grace message. I get saved right into it. And uh, I got saved in Romans 3, Brother Jim Kirkwood, back in uh, Illinois. And that was, that was my, that was my uh, favorite book when I, when I first started. It then went to the book of Galatians, because the book of Galatians teaches you, well, Handbook of Salvation is Romans, right? Romans is the Handbook of Salvation. Galatians is the one that's, that, that, that's that um, establish you that you're not under law or religion, but you're under grace. It frees you up in Christ. That's the book of Galatians. So that became my favorite book. The, then the book of Colossians, which is a wonderful short book of, of, of four chapters, but it's, it's, it's jam-packed with life in Christ Jesus. And we're going to see that uh, uh, maybe even this study, uh, if not, maybe uh, then next week. But then the book of Philippians became my favorite book. As you can see, Brother Ryan, he, he made this nice gift for me, Philippians 3.14, where the Apostle Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That was Paul's life's verse. That was his life's verse. That was his passion for his life. You know, many think that Paul, only, uh, his, his only motivation was that the life of Christ would live out through him. And that was, that's true, that that was a motivation. Uh, his leading earthly motivation. But the Apostle Paul understood that there was promise of life, which is now is life in Christ, you know, for to me to live as Christ. We'll see that in a moment. But he also had something that he was striving for, pressing. Press means to put pressure, pressure. He's pushing towards that goal. Paul didn't just live a life of nonchalant in Christ. He was pressing for something. And the something is what the Lord promised him, a, the prize for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, to win a prize, you have to put some effort into it, and you're competing. And that's what the Apostle Paul was doing. And so that was his life's motivation. We'll see that in chapter 3. Here in chapter number 2, if you look with me, let's uh, read down a few verses, and we'll have a word of prayer. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, If there 
be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one, uh, excuse me, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, Amen. of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And as, as Dodie said, amen to that. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do stop right now. We bow our hearts and our minds, dear Lord, before your holy, awesome word. We thank you, Father, for the word made flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, your precious son, the glorious savior, the one who came to earth and lived a perfect sinless life and then died on that cruel and criminal Roman cross for our sins, Father. He shed his innocent, precious blood so that we might have life with you forever. And we thank you for that precious gift of the sacrifice of your son, the Lord Jesus, on Calvary. We thank you for his life given to us by faith today when we trust him by your marvelous grace, that no works of our own are, 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 are required but that we simply place our faith, that is our trust, in him, the Lord Jesus Christ, and him alone. So thank you for the wonderful grace of God and the, and the ease of which we can have everlasting life as a free gift in this dispensation of grace. Thank you for your wonderful grace, Father. We thank you for your holy word, Heavenly Father, the word that we can hold and have, that we can read and study each and every day, and, 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 and especially that we can come together with those of like precious faith and study of your word today. What a wonderful privilege that is, what, a, what an honor that is. I pray none of us take that for granted ever, Father. But we're thankful, those of us who are here today, and we, and we speak on behalf of those who are with us in spirit, who are watching online, that, that we're, we can have your word. So, Father, as we endeavor to study your word this morning, especially to, to, see, to see the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you give us great insight, understanding, and wisdom. And as always, as I pray each week, a greater appreciation of your Son, the precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen. Here in chapter number two, so the book of Philippians, it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, all of Paul's epistles, but Philippians, the reason it's my favorite book, because it is jam-packed. Everything is about him. And Philippians is the, is the book of love, okay? Love, the love of Christ. Um, you have Ephesians before it, that's, that, that's a type of the, 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 the body of Christ, the church. And then you have the book of Colossians. Uh, it shows Christ as the head. But it, it's a spousal epistle. They're not sister epistles. They're spousal. It's like a, a wife and a husband. Well, the one that's in the middle between them is this book. And what brings them together? Love, right? What binds them together is love. And this one is about the love of Christ. But the love of Christ uh, leads to the mind of Christ or vice versa. The mind of Christ or his love for us led for him to do what he did at Calvary, and that love spurs us to have his mind as well. Because what, what Paul says, look at verse number five. Look at verse number five. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And when the apostle Paul calls him Christ Jesus, when he puts Christ first, he's focusing on what he accomplished at Calvary. He's suffering at Calvary. There's the suffering and then the glory that shall be revealed. But, and we'll, we'll see that glory in a minute where he says he, God has highly exalted him. But first he had to humble himself and sacrifice himself, okay? That was his mind, and God wants us to have the same mind towards each other. Look with me at verse number one again. Paul says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, what was, what was, what was, what's this consolation, this, this consoling? This comfort. Well, Paul was in, he was in uh, prison. If you look with me at chapter 1, 
Look at chapter 1, verse 29. Chapter 1, verse 29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ. Again, when you see Christ, think of his suffering. Not only to believe on him, that means to trust him as your Savior. That's the, that's the first thing you do is you trust him as your Savior. But look what, he, what also is the privilege. But also to suffer for whose sake? His sake. And that has to do with the, the suffering with Christ of Romans 8, 17. What means to be a joint heir is to suffer with him, to suffer the way he does. And that long suffering, 1 Timothy 1, has to do with the mystery, the grace message. Christ is showing forth all long suffering for a pattern. So when he talks about suffering with Christ, it has to do with that which is associated with Paul's gospel. The Romans 8, 17, these sufferings, uh, 2 Timothy 3, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's not just the regular sufferings the world goes through, the pains and heartaches of this world. It is specific to the all long suffering for a pattern. It's the, it's the suffering of Christ and with Christ that are associated with the grace message and the mystery. This chart here with the cross in it, the cross is the, is the, is the center of everything that God's doing in all the Bible. But I put it in red with Paul's epistles because what God's doing today, he's, he's operating in the present, the books of Romans through Philemon, the books of the Apostle Paul, all of them start with Paul. It's the grace message called the mystery of Christ. The agency that God is forming today is the body of Christ. And the place that we're destined to, predestinated to, is his heavenly kingdom. And when Paul talks about suffering, he's talking about that associated with his message. It's not just the general suffering of the world or the general suffering of denominational brethren. It is the suffering that comes along because you believe this message. You're going to be rejected by people. You're going to be rejected by your own family and friends, your wives, your husbands. Maybe you older, your own children are going to reject it. You could believe this and your own child won't believe it. Those are the sufferings, the heart sufferings that come along with you being a grace believer. I can't tell you, and Krista can, and I can't tell you the number of people who have lost family members and friends over the years. Half of them, I don't even tell them. I don't want to even put that on them. They'll call them and say, I, I, my wife left Brother Ron or my husband left, or they, my, my, my own children reject them. It's, it hurts their heart. I get it. Our, our first conversation, I told Krista, I said, <coughs> not everybody's going to receive this, even your own family members. It was hard for her to grasp that. Well, none of them are in the grace message to this day. I've, I've shared it with them, all of them. That's something that's on her heart every day. We're going to go back to Minnesota, and we can't discuss these things in detail with her own family. We're going to have a family reunion, and uh, we can only give little baby stuff to them. That's just the way it is. It hurts. We wish we can go and discuss these things like we do freely here, but we can't. That's part of the suffering for Christ's sake, suffering with Christ, okay? That's what Paul is talking about. But that was his life. In verse number 30, look at Philippians 1.30. Paul says, having the same conflict. What was the conflict? Which ye saw in me and now here to be in me. Paul was going through sufferings, not because he did anything wrong. He was in prison there because he preached Christ according to Revelation of Mystery. Look at uh, chapter 1, verse 21. For to me... This was the theme of, 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 the, of the passage a couple weeks ago when we were looking at This is the theme of chapter 1. For to me, that's Paul. And, and remember what I said, when Paul personalized it, he's saying that's not true for everybody. It should be true, but it's not. When Paul says in Romans 8, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not uh, uh, worthy to be compared to the uh, glory shall be revealed in us. Paul is, he, that's his mindset that Christ gave him, but that wasn't true. He didn't say, for, I reckon, for, for we reckon, Paul knew it was only for those who had the mind of Christ. Even this, even my favorite verse, my favorite chapter of my favorite book, I, why, did Paul, why didn't Paul say, we press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God? He knew never, not everybody was going to do that. Sure. Now, he's the pattern. He's the end sample, right? He's saying, he personalized, says, look what I'm pressing toward. Now, you should too. When we get over to Philippians 3, you're going to see he says that. He says, here I'm pressing, and you should, be just like my, you should be just like me. Really, you should be just like Christ, right? Verse number 21, for to me to live is what? Christ. I'm willing to suffer with him. That's what he's saying, Christ. Can I tell you something? That's not his position he's talking about. 
Everyone is in Christ. But he's talking about living your, your walk of faith. His walk was Christ. He was, a, he was willing to suffer for this truth in Christ's stead. For to me to live is Christ. But what happens when you die physically? It's gain, right? And to die is gain. God, I told Chris the death is, I just sit, sometimes I'll just sit there and contemplate stuff. I'll sit, I like to sit on the, on the floor at the couch and she sit there. And I'll contemplate, think about life, whatever. And I said, boy, death is a, death is, well, depends on what the, but physical death is a bear, man. You just, we, we watch these shows like First 48. I, we like to solve crimes, we like justice. And, and, I, and I'll say, man, the, the, the destruction they leave in the lives of the, of the victims, their children and their parents and their family, it just changed generations. Because the children, anyway. And I said, boy, death is something, man. God wanted death to be that. It's permanent, you know, it's just, the, just, it's just the, the, the loss associated with death in the world. But he changed the dynamic through a, a certain death and resurrection, the Lord. And so now, even when one of the saints die, we're not in despair like those that, we don't sorrow like those no, have no hope. We know we're gonna see him. Dodie, you're gonna see Sister Charlene. You've been missing Charlene. She gave your life greater purpose. But you know, Charlene's waiting on us. She's waiting <coughs> on us. She's gonna be there at that day. That's right, that's right. See, you're gonna see her again, we know that. Paul says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even though even those that which sleep in Jesus shall God bring. We're going to see our loved ones again if they're in Christ. We're the only ones who have that hope. The, the heathen don't have that hope. <laughs> My name's Ron. There was a brother named Ron back in Illinois. This guy was rough, man. He was a grace believer. He come out of Catholic background. His Catholic aunt died. He was sitting in that, in that car coming back uh, from the funeral, going to the, the graveyard with his, with his aunt, other aunts and mother and aunt. And one of those ladies said, oh, well, she's in a better place. He says, how do you know that? I said, oh, boy. <laughs> right in the limousine. That was Ron. He didn't care. He's one of these gruff Chicago dudes, man. And he explained to her, listen, the only way she's in a better place in heaven is if she trusted the Lord Jesus. He said it right there. And they're all like, oh, but well, that's the truth. They don't want to hear it. They just, it's magically think, okay, everybody goes to heaven if they're good. You know, who defines that? But the point is, we have that. For to, look what Paul says in, in 121. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know what Paul says? He says, I could stay or I could go at this yeah. point. He had been 30 years in the ministry. He, 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 he was pressing. He, he, listen, Paul was like, I want to be with the Lord. He was in a straight betwixt. He, he was in a rock and hard place. Do I stay or do I go? Like the song yeah. said. And Paul says, I'm going to stay for your sake. For you. And he says, I'm confident I am. Yeah. You know why? He says, dear Lord, I want to stay for this. Says, yep, you get it. You got he it. Yeah. He was willing to suffer for, for, their, for sake. their sake. Yeah, for their sake. Yeah. And so that's his life. And that's how God wants us to live. Over in, look at chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And what that was, a, a, a humble mind of faith towards the Father. Okay? He, he later says, look at chapter 2, verse number 12. Wherefore, Philippians 2, 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, these Philippians were obedient, right? Since Acts 16. Not as in my presence only. Notice Paul was there in Acts 16, but he had to leave, Right? He went on to Thessalonica and to Berea and to, and to Corinth and to Ephesus and, and all these different places. But when he left, it wasn't like disobedient children who will only obey when their father's there. Father goes off for a long business trip. They acting a fool. Mama had to say, no, when your father got okay, mother, you know. No, no, no. It says, but now much more in my absence. They, they would be the children who when daddy left, they were even better. They start to learn about what their father desires them to do. Can you imagine being a father and your children act better as you go? And you're like, man, I got a dilemma here. What? I'm the enforcer. <laughs> what would you say, Richard? Be nice. I know. It would be nice, wouldn't it? To know that. To know that. To know that. It would be awesome. You, your, your wife says, the children have been very nice. They're, they're quoting dad and everything. Dad wants us to do this. Dad said do that. You'd be like, all right. You start, they're, they're starting to mature. They're starting to develop my, my thinking. Well, that was that. Look what he says, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, 
as you have always obeyed, not, in, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out, work out. Not You're, work for. Not work for, that's right. A lot of people, Dodie, read that as work for yeah. your salvation right. with fear and trembling. That says work out. You already have salvation, now work it out. Be who God called you to be. It's a workout. My, my wife is depressed now. They shut down the health clubs again. They opened them suckers for two weeks and shut it down. Craig, too, right, Craig? I saw Craig early this morning. I said, what you doing here? The health club shut down. Man. <laughs> I could be here now. I was like, I get it, bro. Krista's thinking about getting up early. on a run. She likes to run. It's too hot in, in California. But they shut it down again, which is crazy, man. Anyway, don't depress me with all this stuff. I know. It's so ridiculous. It's so arbitrary what they choose to shut down and what they choose to leave open. It's starting to you need work. People need to work out, right? I, I, I told them no. they, they shut. Not, not Rachel. You got great genetics. Okay. Most people do. That's essential. Church is the most essential. A grace church is the most essential. They talk about essential business. I was telling Ted, I go, the governor shut down churches and stuff, but we still going to meet. Yeah. Because this is, this is essential for your inner man. The, the fellowship. That's right. That too. The fellowship is important. Yeah. I always felt that. Yeah. I, get, I, get, I get folks write me, Brother Ron, this shutdown, the, 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 and they're not letting people go to church. It's, it's, it's a spiritual thing. I say, it's a spirit. It, it's a spir this is all a spiritual battle. It's darkness, all this yeah. stuff. It is. So I said, nope, we're we going to do this, man, because this is essential. That's what he said, work out. This is the spiritual health club, as it were. That's what the local assembly is designed for. Okay, and just so you know, it's not you doing it when you're obeying the doctrine. Verse 13, for it is who? God, which worketh in you both to will, give you the willingness, and to do the ability, the capacity of his what? Good pleasure. And that is getting Christ according to the revelation of mystery out. That's the purpose. And when he talks about that mind of Christ, it's one of humility. The Lord humbled himself. He went from the king of glory in heaven down to a poor carpenter in Nazareth and, and, and a three, that's right, the, the Nazareth, and, and a three and a half year ministry amongst people who hated him for the most part. But he was faithful. He was faithful. And what happens when you're faithful? Now, God doesn't ask us to be dead sacrifices. Like he, he's not asking us to die. Only Christ could die for the sins of the world. But you know what he's asking us to do to be living sacrifices, right? It's a sacrifice. We got so many people here right now today and in our assembly normal who come from hours away, multiple hours away. I used to attend uh, Brother Richard Jordan assembly. It was a uh, 55 minutes drive, 55 minute drive. And then before that, Jim Kirkwood was longer than that, over an hour. And I said, hey, look at the Lord. I went from Kirkwood to Jordan he, he shortened my, my commute about 10 minutes, okay? <laughs> but it was still close to an hour. My mother's like, well, you go way out there. I just was praying the car, the car would last. I'd be on the expressway in Chicago, and in that stop-and-go traffic, the car's on, 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 on. I said, Lord, just get me there, 15 minutes. I'd get in the parking lot. I'd get into the parking lot of Jim Kirkwood's church, and the car was shut off. I didn't even worry about it. I was like, I'll deal with it when I come out. And then i come out there at night, and I said, please, Lord. Now it's less traffic on the way back. Arrow, I'm going. I remember those days. God, I did that at the Twin Cities. Chris and I would pull in. She's right. We pull in. Now we had so many saints there, man, and a lot of them good handyman and mechanics. I'd walk in there and say something's going on with my alternator. Some they say, give me, "Where are your keys at, brother Ron?" I said, "But we about to start church. Just give me the keys." You know. What I mean? By the time it's over, they done went to the bought a battery of some, some parts for the thing and work. That's the body. They worked on the car. That's how they say thanks. And they had the thing running better than it ever did. I just had to say something. We don't, here in California, I mean, we, we, yeah, we don't have as many folks just because of the area and the, the spiritual darkness. But that's how the body works. They were happy to, if I mentioned something, they were on it. <laughs> I got to say this. Chris is sitting in here, uh, Jada Lynn's with the children. Being a man, you got to let your pride go. We were talking about that this morning. I don't, she already knows. She already, I don't know how to do anything handyman-wise. I was, I, this was my goal. We had, a, 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 in, a, in a house in Coon Rapids, Minnesota, we had a um, dishwasher. 
my job was to unplug the dishwasher, unplug the dishwasher. I don't know what happened, but I end up with a big hole in the wall. She's saying, call this brother, call that brother, they can do it. No, I ain't calling them, I'm a man, you know. I ain't calling another man to unplug a dishwasher. <laughs> it turns out, I did have to call, what is it, Dirk? Or Dirk, I'm gonna say, brother Dirk, come in, man. I said, man, he lived down the street. I said, I'm trying to unplug a dishwasher. He gets there, he moves the dishwasher forward. Now, most plugs you plug into the wall. The dishwasher, the plug comes from the basement because of the, the oh, amount of yeah. electricity, and you, you plug it from the dishwasher. Right. That whole time, I'm breaking the wall out. I'm just getting this plug. I ain't. <laughs> yeah, he goes, he goes like this. He moves the dishwasher. He goes, All right, brother. <laughs> I was so embarrassed, man. I was so embarrassed. It was so embarrassing. But, but that's the body, man. I, anything I need, I should have just called him. I should have just let my pride. I was a young man. I'm like, I ain't got to have no guy come unplug an appliance for me. <laughs> yes, I did. We had to patch the wall up. It was embarrassing. <laughs> but, but man, we would say something. And those saints, wouldn't they? Do? I mean, Bill, Krista mentioned something about a floor. She was like, he's like, oh, I work at the, at the school. I tile their floors. I'll be there. They would just come and tile the floor. No, no, nothing. We needed, we needed a water heater fixed or something. These brothers would just say, what you need, we got it. That's how the body should work. That's how God wants us to work. Because notice what he says in verse 1, Philippians 2. If there be therefore, Paul says, listen, there's going to be some suffering, but if there's any consolation for the suffering or the consoling comfort in Christ, notice any comfort of love. Remember I said that love? Any, if any fellowship of the Spirit. Y'all don't know how that made me feel. Us feel that when these brothers would come and we, you can't trust the heathen, so it's nice to have brothers you can trust to help with things. Yeah, it's, it was fantastic. If any bowels and mercies, that, that, that's that inward affection towards others. In the heart. In the heart, yep, in affection. Mercies. Being tender to them. You know, I'm always reminded, or I remind my, myself each day of God's tender mercies. I'll just tell Chris, I go, we trust the Lord. We just trust his mercy, man, day by day. And the Bible talks about new mercies every morning, right? David talked about the Lord's tender mercies. That's what I depend on the Lord for, his tender mercies. It works, man. He, he is so merciful. That, but but can, I, can I be honest? I'm, I'm going to be honest because I want people to see this. Here it is. Just because you're a member of the body of Christ, there are mercies associated to it. Believe me, okay? Just because you're in Christ, positionally. But man, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the book of Philippians teach, ta taught me and teaches us that when you, when, when you associate yourself with the truth of the Apostle Paul, being a part of what God's doing in the grace message, in the mystery, there's a, even more extended mercy. Everyone, Epaphroditus, God had mercy on him. The Lord had mercy on the, on the house of Onesiphorus. All these men who were associated with the Apostle Paul, God gave special mercy to. And he did it in the Old Testament. He does it now. That's God's principle. Exodus 33, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And whom I studied that for rich and mercy for riches. That's right. That's right. This is what I did you just Can I read you, got, you got I you got tender mercy. Hold on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can go get um, tender mercies. And and the point is, when you're associated with this truth here, that's what God is looking for. Okay. I don't want you to put too much on there because it's live and it's recording. So all right. Tender mercies. Now, that's what Paul is talking about. Um, it's in Philippians 2 where Paul talks about Epaphroditus. And he was laboring with Paul and for the apostle Paul. In fact, he, he was the one who provided for the apostle Paul when no one else did at a time. Chris and I have some folks like that, Epaphroditus, who they just say, you know, we appreciate you and your family's sacrifice. So we want to give to you to help you guys, because we know you sacrifice for the ministry. I can't have a, 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 a real secular job. That's a, you, can't, you can't do any of that stuff. So there's a suffering to come along with it. 
you got to be flexible. You got to be able to travel and talk to people day and night. We'd be on a, we'll be out somewhere. Somebody says, "Did you, Christa, you guys ever take an actual vacation?" I go, "No." You sure don't. No. Oh yeah, you, I forgot you. I wasn't even talking about you. When we were in Yellowstone, the Yellowstone Park, or, or out that way, we got a nice call from Rachel. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> but see, we do that. That's where we're in ministry. But we never take an actual vacation because even when we travel. We usually travel to Southern California or to Minnesota. When we travel, it's to minister to saints. Because everywhere we go, if we went to Florida, say, oh, let's go to Florida. Or something. Well, there's saints in Florida who say, hey, Brother Ron, you don't be in Florida. Oh, you got to do this. Say, okay, we do it. Everywhere we go, all 50 states. I go, oh, God. And how am I sneak away from y'all, you know? You'd be at the beach, I said. Brother Ron. <laughs> <laughs> Fernando said, I'm at the beach putting on my stuff in Florida. They'd be like, hey, Brother Ron, what's up? they pulling out Bibles and tracks. Check this out, man. I said, all right, let's do it. <laughs> I literally got on the plane, and there was a brother in the Lord. When we, when we went to uh, Wyoming last week, uh, Yellowstone, on our connecting flight, it was a brother. We knew him. He was coming. He was going there. He pulled a track. Hey, Brother Ron, here's the tracks, man. All right. He texts me all the time, every day. He know who he is. I love him. But he's like, hey, this is what we're doing. So no, we never take a vacation just as a family. It's always safe. But that's fine. That's part of life and ministry. But we have some folks who appreciate that sacrifice and want to be there. And it talks about, in verse 27, look at Philippians 2.27, about this Epaphroditus. Verse 26, for he longed after you all. Right, look at verse 25. I want you to see, when I talk about that, it's associated with the, with the truth, it, it, that, that tender mercies. The reason God had tender mercies on David is not because he, he, he loved David more than anyone else. It was because David had a heart after God. David says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And he sinned against God. When he committed adultery and murder against Bathsheba and Uriah, he says, against thee and thee alone I have sinned, Lord. Paul, uh, David knew the truth. The, the true person he offended was not those people, Uriah and Bathsheba, it was God. He offended against God's word, his truth. And David had a humble heart to say, I'm sorry, Lord. And David knew how to, how to repent before Almighty God. And so God made David the king. But God made David a prince. Out here, I, I, read, I read for you guys last Sunday at the end, we were in Ezekiel, and it says the city... Uh, David's going to be their prince, and the Lord Jesus is going to be the king, but David's going to be their prince. David's heart for God there gave him mercy that extends out forever because he loved God with his, all his heart. Today, if you love this message and are part of it, not just love it, but you're part of it. When I, when I tell the people, when you pray, if, if, if you, you don't have a grace church like we do, but you watch this ministry, you pray for us. You labor in prayer for me and my family and these saints. That's part of it. And giving, that's proving the sincerity of love. Like, that's, that's, that's another way. I'm serious that that's being a part of us for now. Obviously, we want you to be here. That's why we put them on it here, ultimately. But in the meantime, you can help that way, pray and give. And there's that mercy of God extended in your behalf because you obey. Look at this man here, verse 25, Philippians 2.25. Yet I suppose it necessary... To send to you Epaphroditus, my brother. Now, now, why didn't Paul say our brother? He says, my brother. He could have believed he said, because Epaphroditus was one of them. He could have said, our brother. He was a brother in the Lord. You know, Paul didn't say our brother. He said, my brother. Why did he personalize it? When Paul personalized something, it means something. In book of Proverbs, it says, uh, is that 1717, 17, Ryan? You can check it. A brother is born for adversity. 1717 might be the other one about, about uh, searching out a matter. Get, get that reference for me. A brother is born for adversity. When Paul went through adversities, Epaphroditus became not just a brother, but my brother. Yeah, this brother, 17, oh, thank you. And companion. And, com and companion. That's, that's next. But the issue of being my brother, brothers are there for each other. Why God give you brothers is to be there for you. The most beautiful example of that were these twin boys who were born, identical twin boys. They come out of their mother's womb. This is a video of it. They've been in their mother's womb, and Rachel, Rachel has an identical twin sister. They were together, same genetic. 
They've been in their mother's womb, and they've been together all that time in their gestation period. 40 weeks, right? Nine months of fruit bearing. And when they came out, they were hugging each other. As soon as the nurses took them to clean them off and to swaddle them, they, they, they screamed, bloody murder, ah! And then they put them back together, and they went, mm. And they take them apart, ah! Put them back together, mm. It was the craziest thing. These were big, they were newborns. When they were together, they were just at peace. You could see it. And as soon as they separate them, they start screaming. And, and they realize, wait a minute. And they put them back together, and they kept doing it. And I saw that. I said, that's what God is trying to show with that. Brothers, of, that's, that's, the, that's the true crime of Cain, y'all. Cain and Abel were twin brothers. The first man born were twin brothers. Same genetics. I'm sure they were identical. I'm sure they were. Same parents, same situation. One believed God, one didn't. He killed the one person he was supposed to be there for. He killed his brother. Brothers are born for adversity. So when Paul says, my brother, yes, he's our brother or their brother, but no, he says he proved himself to be born for my adversity. He was there for me, man. Listen. There you go. That's the next part. And companion in labor. The my brother part was Paul recognized this man labored, when I say labored, not just in ministry, but his secular job or his day job, he made money to give to Paul, take care of his needs. He took care of him. He was, he was helping him in his adversity. But that companion in labor has to do with that ministry. They were laboring together for the truth of the gospel of grace, look at the rest, and fellow soldier. What that mean? He was on the front lines. He didn't retreat. He didn't retreat. You know, think about David. When he was supposed to be at war, that's the one time he didn't go to war as the king is when he saw Bathsheba. He was supposed to be leading the troops. Kings, kings didn't get to the back of the line, at least not the kings of Israel. They were on the front lines. Most of the Gentile kings would put their troops out there and they'd be in the back. The kings of Israel with God, they on the front line. David would be on his white steed with his crown ready for battle. He was a man of war. Saul killed his thousands, but David's his tens of thousands. That's what the women of Israel would shout coming back. David was a warrior, man. David was no punk. He was a warrior. He'd kill you. He was a bloody man, but he was battling for the Lord. You know at 17 years old, David looked at Goliath and said, what's this uncircumcised Philistine dog? He was punking Israel Saul in the army for 40 days, coming out there, looking big, you punks, and they said, yeah, we are, all right. <laughs> David, David went to check, his father said, go check on your brothers who are in the army. they like, get your little self away from here, go, go. David was like, what are y'all, what's going on? It's been 40 days, why does this guy keep coming out here every day mocking us? David says, I'm going to take him and his brothers, I'm taking them all out. David was fearsome. He wrestled bears and lions to, 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 to keep his sheep. He was a shepherd boy. God loved that about David, that zeal, but add that with a soft heart and you got a man of God. Well, that's what God is looking for. This is your fellow soldier. Paul tells Timothy, no man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, right? We're in warfare, and God needs some men to stand up, man. The, I, I said on a um, broadcast recently, the reason why there's not a lot of grace churches is not a, it, it's not that God doesn't have enough men in the body to lead grace churches. I know one who's not leading one, her brother, my wife's brother, Gary. Years ago back in Minnesota, I told him this. They, everywhere he went and lived, they needed a grace, a, a grace man, a grace pastor. He, he was a chaplain. He wants to be a, 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 a pastor. He's been, he's been all over the place, almost 50 years old. And had he just humbled himself and listened to me years ago, he would have been in the grace of They needed him. Every, I know saints who were looking for a pastor, and, and I go, your brother could be there, Krista. He could be there. They could be there. He could be there. But he didn't want to humble himself to this truth. So the, the fact that there are in a lot of grace churches is not because God didn't provide the men. It's because the men don't want to believe this truth, see? They don't want to suffer for this. Brother Charles Stanley in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. He's on TV, radio. Some of the saints back in my old church in Chicago wrote him about the grace message because he, he, he got the salvation prescription right on, on Easter one time. He preached it like it was, he was a grace preacher. So they said, if he got that, maybe we can show him the word a little more perfectly. 
he writes back, I see what you guys are saying about Paul and all of this. I see it. He's a Southern Baptist. He says, I see it. He says, but if I teach that, I'm going to lose my church. I'm going to lose my pension. I'm going to lose now. We said, no, you're going to lose then, man. That man, is, he's a multimillionaire, rich as can be, but he's preaching the wrong message. Hey, he would have he gotten a few of his flock. He had thousands of people. He probably got 100 people to come with him. Some saying, you know what, I've been seeing that too, Pastor uh, Charles. Mm -hmm. He wanted those millions. He wanted the millions. He wanted to fly in those G4 planes and stuff all around to the convention. See, he wanted, he wanted the now. He wasn't willing to suffer now for then, right? This man suffered now. Fellow soldier, verse 25, but your messenger, he was the one who would go back and forth for the Philippians. And he that ministered to my, what, wants. Notice Paul didn't even say my needs. He said my wants. Yeah. It's one thing to take care of some needs, basic needs, right, food, clothing, you know, shelter, whatever. But can I say something? When you just say, Brother Paul, what do you want? You want to go golf trip, man? I got it. you. Want, you want to go to Augusta Golf Trip? Let me work a little bit. $5,000, here you go. What, what, you, I want you to relax, man. You're in ministry. You got to relax. Man. Go. My wants. That's a brother there. Watch this. For he longed after you all. He, he, he was thinking about them, desiring to see them again, and was full of heaviness. But look why he was full of heaviness. Because that ye had heard that he had been sick. So the brother had some physical infirmities, okay? Weakness in his body. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death. He was near death, but God. You see that's right there, but God. But God had mercy on him. And it's that special Exodus 33 mercy. I won't have mercy. He didn't die. Uh, uh, he didn't, he didn't, um, he was able to continue on and live and provide for the apostle Paul and to build fruit to his account one of the one every day God gives us, it's a chance to build fruit to our bound to, to our account. So every day God gives you, it's another day of grace to for his glory and fruit abound to your account at the judgment seat. And not on him only, but on me also. Paul would have missed his friend, his brother, his companion, his fellow. So lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I had sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, ye may rejoice and that I might be the less sorrowful. And look what he said, look what he says about this man who God's mercy was upon. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in what? Rep reputation, hold him up, lift him up in reputation, point to him. Paul says, know them who are labor among you and over in the Lord, esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, right? Yeah. Paul says, look at this man and say, that's a man of God. Why? Verse 30, because for the work of Christ, for the work of Christ, what is that? The man suffered to get this message out. There it was. He sacrificed to get the message out. <clears throat> It'd be nine years this month. But it's been longer. Brother Ryan has been there. The only person who's probably been here more than him is me. Because <laughs> I'm the pastor. This man has been there. When we would visit California before we moved here, he'd be there with that video camera. Not this one, it was with his old one, 10 years ago, whatever. With his questions. He's got a job. He said, I want to be there. I want to record these things. I want to edit these things. He's been doing that every day for nine straight, almost 10 years. Because remember, he was doing it before we moved here. He's, the, he's one of the main reasons we are here. I, got, I, I told you the story. I got the call as I'm praying and talking to Krista about it's going to be hard. We, we got a brother here from Twin Cities Grace Fellowship, Brother Ted, doesn't he? That was the hardest day of my life to leave our lives, since Krista's in here usually. It was the hardest day of our life, wasn't it, Krista? See, 125 saints at that last Sunday, they didn't even let me preach. I was ready to preach, man. They were like, no, we're having a send-off. I had my notes. I was ready. They didn't tell me until I was ready to preach. They go, no, Brother Ryan, you ain't going to preach today. And I was upset. <laughs> I said, no, I got something to say. I got to preach. I'm... They said, no, 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 we're having a send-off. We had a meal. It was, it was fine. It was fine. But the, at the end of that thing, man, a couple hours, it was time to go, my last Sunday. It was a line of people just to say bye. I looked at Wade. It was so hard. Wade was just, he was just crying. I can't even talk about it. But they said, Brother Ron, 
we know they need you out of California. Well, before all that, I'm talking to Krista. It's hard to leave, you know, what do we do? But didn't Wade come visit us? He did. He came and visit us years later. I'm just talking about the day we left. But anyway, we, we contemplate. My phone rings. I don't answer the phone, especially if, if Ted knows that. If I, if I don't know your area code, you know, he called a New Hampshire phone number looking for the place, you know. I see 209 area code. I didn't know what it went in this. is Modesto, California. And I said, Krista, we got a call from California. This is why we're discussing. My phone read it. And it was Ryan. It was Ryan. And he he'd heard about our ministry and all this stuff. And I think I said something like, well, if you like that, what, what do you think if, if, you, if we come out there or we have one out there? He was like, he said some type of California phrase like cool or, you know, something <laughs> awesome, you know, whatever, whatever you say, right? Yeah. You probably remember. And I was like, there it is, honey. There it is. She was like, there it is. Now the hard part was leaving. But you know what? I, I said it this morning. We haven't regretted moving here. We, we don't like the politics of California. We don't like the bums and junkies. Things have gotten worse. But we never felt like this wasn't where God called us. When we go back to Minnesota, we get back here, we go, yeah. Because they believe me, at least for the first few times I went to Minnesota, they were like, Brother Ryan, you know, you, you come back, right? You know, <laughs> no, man, we out there. Jada Lynn says, family's in Minnesota. I want to move back to Minnesota. I said, I get it. We'll let you go in the summertime. Mm-hmm. But we're here, OK? God called us here. We want to be here. Because, you know, the work of Christ has to be done. There's a sacrifice, isn't it? Yeah. The saints out there sacrifice for, for, for you guys. You know that? Please don't take this for granted because we had 125 people there who were more than willing to provide for us and take care of us and all that stuff. And they, they to a person, when those elders came and said, look, Brother Ron, we don't want you to leave, man. We love you. But we get it. We, we, we get it. We, y'all, you're needed. One of them said, you're the, you're the man God has for California. He called it the land of fruit and nuts out there. <laughs> He's like, it's very few laborers out there for the grace message. We got, we got guys. There are guys all in the Midwest. They, you're needed out in Northern California because they don't have nobody up there. I said, yep. It was hard for them to let us go. It was hard for Chris and I to leave. But we never regret being here. You know why? Because of this. The work of Christ. We knew that this was needed here. And each one of y'all, Dodie, you heard the radio, Richie, you heard the radio. Each one of y'all say, say, oh, there's a place for us to go now. We got folks come from over an hour, two hours, you know. If, you, if you're within two hours of our assembly, it's for you. For real. It is. That's why, Richard, you were cracking up. I was right across the street from you, man. <laughs> You found out that the assembly that you're listening to on the radio is right across the street. How about that? But we got folks come from Hercules and San Francisco, Oakland, everywhere, man. Modesto. Modesto by the way, I bring up Ryan. Modesto is not down the street, OK? This man, Ryan probably drives more uh, in one <clears throat> week than anybody else I know. His markets in like. Tahoe, Lake Tahoe. He was be in San Francisco. He'd be in Plaza. He'd be all over the place. He'd know, and out here, Nevada, too. Nevada. Nevada. This man does. That's his day job, and he does the other ministry stuff. The work of Christ. That's a sacrifice, man. We have to hold such in reputation. That's why I bring that up, because if he can do it, we all can do it, right? So I'm saying, if you live within two hours, and by the way, there are folks listening to me, I hear from them, they live within two hours of our assembly, they could be here. Yeah. Fernando, let me tell you what, Brother Fernando, the man gets, he leaves at 7 in the morning from San Francisco, say, I'm going to pick Brother Ron up, because I leave a little earlier with, than Christmas sometimes, with me, and we're going to meet at 9 o'clock or something like that. That's the work of Christ, that's sacrifice. He could, be, he could sleep for another two hours and say, oh, I'll come in. But you know what he does? Brother Ron, I'm on my way from San Francisco. And then Brother Larry, because of the virus, can't be with us, but he'd pick Brother Larry up. Your, your, your family, right? Your wife and daughter. You got a little girl and a wife. They got to get up extra early to come. That's sacrifice. They sacrifice sleep and stuff like that. This is what God's looking for. Verse 30, because for the work of Christ, that's what it's all about. He was nigh unto death. 
not regarding his what? His life to supply your lack of service toward me. The man literally worked himself half to death so he can provide for the Apostle Paul. Think about that. His job was making money so he could take it and give it to Paul, take care of Paul. That was his job. How about that? That's a man right there. That's a man. That's the mind of Christ. Go back to chapter uh, 2, verse 5. Um, look at verse number 5, uh, Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. We're about to end soon, but you know what? The mind of Christ, what's his thinking like? It's one of selfless sacrifice and, 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 and uh, uh, service, right, to the Lord. Now, how do we serve the Lord today? By serving other saints. Now, the main way we do that is through a local assembly. Why is it important to have a local assembly? So that you can put these things into action. Really, all of Paul's epistles are written in, in a context of in a local assembly. That's what they're for. But I understand not everyone has a local assembly because what I mentioned earlier, the men that God has in the body aren't faithful. <clears throat> but one of the mercies of God is through the blessing of technology, you're, you know, even though it, it's, in, it's not infallible, you can pray for us. You could give to support the ministry. These are things you could do from afar in the name of in the work of Christ, in the, in the name of the mystery of Christ, okay? Now, the mind of Christ. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I can't talk about, Ted, Ted you done brought everything up now about my ministry back in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Your very presence here you makes it he reminiscent. Like you, like everything he was describing, like when you, when you said he was from Minnesota, Everything he just described about the saints, that, like, I, that's what I felt. We, we, we miss those saints. That's why we're going back. That's why we go back. It's because we miss them, and to bless them, so they can see our face in the flesh and vice versa, you know. Because I promised them that if the Lord provides, at least every other year, we try to get out there. It used to be every year, but because of different things, we had to extend it every, every two years. And we were back there in 2018. So we're going to get out here this year. Um, the mind of Christ. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Why did God give the, the, the body of Christ his spirit? Why does God give the Holy Ghost? Well, verse 11. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? How do we, how do we um, communicate? It's a spiritual, it's verbally, but that's a spirit, right? That's a spiritual. It, those words are coming out of our inner man. It's a spiritual thing. And the reason we understand each other is because it's the spirit of what he calls the spirit of man. Even women have that. When God made Adam the man, he took Eve out of Adam, woman out of the man, so the same spirit, okay? In, in Malachi, he says, they have the residue of the spirit. So you could talk to a woman. She, now, there is some miscommunication between men and women, just how our brains work. But you can understand, for the most part, we can understand each other if we speak the same uh, language, tongue, right? English for us. Well, that's how men understand men, spiritual communication through our spirits. In that same way, verse 11, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save or accept the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, see that principle? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. We don't have the capacity to understand God without his spirit. You know that? Because it's too high for us. It's too spiritual for us. The Lord Jesus would speak to his apostles and disciples and those people in Israel and he would say something with a spiritual intensity, and it would just go right over their head. So what is that? When Lazarus died, Lazarus, our friend, is asleep, and you ought to be happy, because if I was there, he wouldn't went to sleep. They said, well, Lord, if he was asleep, he, he was sick, he should be all right. He goes, and this says, he says plainly, he's dead, and I'm going to wake him up. Because <laughs> to God, if you die in, in, in the Lord, you just sleep. Your body just sleep. It's just like going to sleep, waking up the next morning. Remember I said what God has designed sleep to do? 
it's to remind you of a resurrection. Every time you take a nap or you sleep, really you're, you're, you're sleep at night, you're slumber at night, it's like, you, it's like death. And then you awake in the morning, it's resurrection. That's what God is teaching with sleep. And if you've ever been so tired, <laughs> I, I played baseball in Arizona in July and August, and it was 120 degrees, we're out there running. I was at 19 years old. We're running, lifting weights, throwing the ball, hitting the ball, just eight hours of that, with a little break in between for some water, Gatorade, and a little shade to cook. I got back that first day of tra training, and I said, I, I played high school football. I had never been so tired in my life. My body was just, and I, I just hit the couch, and I just, I woke up six, six hours later. I, I didn't even know I went to sleep. I was so tired, man. My mother tell you, I called my mother and said, I got blisters on my hand, and I quit. Are you rubbing a baseball bat in the Arizona heat? I said, I can't even. She said, just wait a day, see how things go. They healed up, you know. But I was that, I was just, it was just exhausted. But I remember falling asleep. I don't even remember falling asleep. I just remember waking up like, oh, man. That's how death is. That's how death is. Most folks in accidents and stuff, when they uh, go to the hospital or go in a coma or something, they don't even remember the accident. They don't remember it. They say, what am I, what am I doing in the hospital? Well, you, you, know, you had an accident. Like, really? Yeah. They don't remember. That's how death is. Just... Now, for the grace believer, we awake in the presence of the Lord. Dodie, you were talking about your uh, surgery, heart surgery, last month. And uh, for Dodie, it was like for me to live as Christ <coughs> and to die as gain. They put her under. They have you count backwards. You go to... She's either going to wake up in a recovery room or with the Lord, right? It was nothing for her. Nothing, you know. That was disappointing. All right, she was disappointed. <laughs> That's because I prayed to God to keep you here to at least 90. Okay, Dodie? Yeah. <laughs> I bet you was disappointed. Come on. We're battling over her soul here. The Lord wants to. I sure wasn't disappointed. Nobody, nobody was disappointed that the Lord let you stay. You were the only one. Maybe Charlene. Maybe Charlene. I know. <laughs> but you know what, Dodie, we're glad you're here, you know. The Lord, you've been a blessing. I mean, yeah. I tell people, my preaching is, has gotten to the point where it is because Dodie sits right up front here, and I teach to her. There was a old, there, <laughs> <laughs> she is a great student, great student. And she has the experience of life that, that none of us have. So she, she has been, a, she's, you've been in Christ longer than any of us. You know his faithfulness over all these years, Dodie. I sure do. We had a woman like that back in uh, Minnesota when we first started. Remember Shelby there? This was 2003 or 2004 or whatever. And she, her husband would push her up in a, in a wheelchair, put her right up front there. She was right up front. <laughs> She'd be going profound, profound. <laughs> <laughs> then she'll tell you her story. She'd been to every church in the in the phone book, and, and she was happy to, oh, we missed her. I did her funeral. She went to be with the Lord, and I'd say that Sunday, her empty seat right there, her empty seat. I don't want that to happen with Dodie, Lord. I want us all to go together. Yeah. That means he got to come soon, Dodie. I told her she has to hold my hand going up there. Yeah. I know. Take us all. Let's just have like a, a train of people yeah. going up. All yeah. All well, that would be the rapture then. We got to have a rapture, but for real. Look what Paul says here. Verse number 12. 1 Corinthians 2.12, now we have received not the spirit of the world. Think about that. You know there's a spirit in the world. It's that worldly mindset, right, that thinking process. Aren't we to be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, Romans 12? Notice Paul says, that's not the spirit God gave you, verse number 12, but the spirit which is of God. That's it. God has given his Holy Spirit with to us. Why? That, here's the purpose, we might know. If Matthew here, you say, might not, it's our option. That we might know the things that are what? Freely given to us of God. When you see that word freely and God together, think grace. The things of God's grace, freely. All right, verse 13. Which things also we speak. Ah. Particularly in the context, Paul said he and his men, they speak of these things. Which things also we speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. Man's wisdom tries to teach things, don't they? Yeah, it's called philosophy. Lover of wisdom. 
but which the Holy Ghost teaches. Now, this is how the Holy Ghost teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. He's talking about the spiritual men. The spiritual, spiritual men began to compare these things. What things? Go back to chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse number 4. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4. And my speech and my preaching. Uh oh, some preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. You know what man uses? Enticing words try to lure you. They don't have power in their words like God does, so they use all these fancy words to entice. Watch this. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power, why? Verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. If your faith is in the wisdom of men, it's going to come to naught. Watch but in the power of God. God's power is in this doctrine. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. That has to do with spiritually mature. Yet not the wisdom of this world, what the heathen listen to, nor of the princes of this world that come to <clears throat> naught, the rulers of this world, uh, that's the Lord calls Satan the prince of the, this world. That comes to nothing. That's nothing. It ends up in nothing. Watch this. Verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a what? Mystery. mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. He's talking about this grace message, this mystery. <clears throat> the Holy Ghost will lead you to this. That's why he said we might know. But the problem is most of the body of Christ doesn't know the mystery. They're all over here. And that's not, I, I cringe when, when people say, the Spirit of the Lord led me to this path. I hear these preachers that go, oh, this week I got to preach on this. The Spirit of the Lord just led me to this passage <laughs> over, over here in Matthew chapter 5. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. You, you went there. The Spirit of God would lead you over to, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. No. Look what he says. He talks about the wisdom of God in a mystery. Verse 7. Those are the enticing words, right? Yeah. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He's talking about the mystery given to Paul. Even Peter in 2 Peter 3 says, according to the wisdom that God gave the apostle, our brother, beloved brother Paul. He's talking about the mystery. That's, the, that's what the Holy Ghost teaches. That's the things we're supposed to compare. Uh, go back to chapter 2, verse 14. We're, we're going to end in these three verses. 2.14, but the natural man, that's just... The, 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 how you're born into the world, right? The natural man receiving not the things of the Spirit of God. Just the man who's not regenerated by the Spirit of God, he can't receive the things of the Spirit of God. Why? For they are foolishness with him, unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. By the way, that natural man, he's not just talking about someone who's lost, who's a heathen. Paul is saying that if you are a member of the body of Christ, but you're still thinking in that natural man mindset, you're not going to get this. How come most of the body of Christ doesn't get this? Because they're operating in their flesh. But what happens when you yield to the spirit of God and, and, and listen to the apostle Paul? Consider what I say and the Lord give you understanding all things. Here's what you're doing. Verse number 15. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. That, that has to do with spiritual discernment, doesn't it? Judging. Yet he himself is judge of no man. That's an interesting thing. As you operate in the wisdom of God in the mystery, no one is able to sit in judgment of you. It's like them trying to deal with the Lord. These fools would go up to the Lord and try to catch him in his words, and he just always twisted on them, didn't he? <laughs> right. these, these Sadducees who don't believe in a resurrection said, you know, Lord, Moses said if a man dies without leaving seed, his brother should marry his wife and bring seed for him, okay? The inheritance. Now, this man had seven brothers, so and they all died. And none of them had yeah. seed. So in this resurrection, you talk about whose wife will he be? She be. And the Lord says, thou fool, you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. In the resurrection, they neither given in marriage or married, right? So he got him with the word. He would all, it, so, so many times they tried to get him that it just said they just left him alone. They were so tired of him getting, getting <laughs> twisted. He would, he would put it back on them, right? He, they try to get him, but he was so spiritually wise that he would turn the tables. It just says, it's like a verse that says, 
they just stopped even asking him any questions no more. They were, they, they were so tired of him turning the table. They was like, don't even ask him nothing. That's what I want to do with people. They would be like, Brother Rock, what about this? Oh, well, they'd be like, I'm embarrassed. Verse 16, and here's the point of it. For who have known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Did you see that? He says, look, when you're spiritual, when you have this doctrine, it's the mind of the Lord, right? That he may instruct them. You know what he's saying? Who going to go to the Lord and say, well, Lord, here, let me tell you something you need to know. <laughs> let me tell you something you need to know. Uh-uh. For who have known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. It is. What God has given us or given us the access to the ability is to have his mind. And as we, you, you know, we'll talk about things as brothers and we'll say, in such case, what does the mind of Christ come? And we'll sit and discuss things and say, what would be the, what would be the ex, ex, more excellent choice in that? In that? It's not something that's bad. We're, it's, it's good, better, best. They're all good. But what would the mind, how would you use the mind of Christ? You can only develop that, and we think with other brothers in a local assembly through this doctrine, through the word. That's right. That's the minimum you need. That's what we are to have. But the main thing of the mind of Christ is how do you treat your brethren? Back in Philippians 2, he said, be like-minded. Vows of mercies, kindnesses, and stuff like that. God first look at how we treat one another and then everything else, okay? Well, we'll pick up uh, Philippians chapter number 3 and on uh, next week. That's my favorite chapter. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm extra excited to teach on that one. I was telling Ryan this morning, a lot of brothers, even grace preachers, don't understand Philippians 3. I've asked them. We've asked them. They don't know. You know why? Because you've got to understand the judgment seat of Christ and what it means to be a joint heir with Christ. Philippians 3 is a joint heir with Christ passage. And if you don't understand that issue, you ain't going to understand the verses, but we're going to dig into them next week, okay? Um, if you never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, now's the time. That red cross behind me, I'm glad Brother David Samuelson asked me to do that. He said, Brother Ron, that caught my eye the first time I saw you, and, he, and I asked others, and he did. This guy talks to everybody. He's, they said, hey, we like that little red cross in the breakdown. So I said, I'll do it for you, but I, I'm just going to do it, you know? That's the center of everything. That's, he died to pay for your sins, and you get that everlasting life as a free gift. But then I got the Bible broken down because after you're saved, you got to come into the knowledge of the truth. You got to know how to handle all of God's word, and it's rightly dividing, okay? There's a past in God's word, a present, and a future. We'll help you with that. It is that to help you develop the mind of Christ and a full reward at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul says, we're going to see next week, I press toward the mark for the pro that That's the theme of that one right there. The theme of next of chapter three next week is that Philippians three fourteen. We'll see that next week. All right. My job is to help us all, like the Apostle Paul, do that. Okay, that's that's the job of this ministry. All right. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time tonight, uh, this morning together. We thank you for the saints who are here, particularly Brother Ted, uh, who come all this way to uh, be with us this morning. Even though he um, was dealing with uh, inf family's infirmities, he took the time out. And we, we pray that it was a blessing for him to take time away from family to come this morning. It was a blessing us, for us to have him. But I thank you for all these saints, Father, and those who follow by way of the Internet. We, we come to your word each Sunday, Father, together, looking for you to give us something. And that's what you want us to do, give us something. You're so gracious to us you give us that, that that verse says freely given to us of God and that's what we look for when we open up your holy scriptures father so we thank you for that today we ask that you bless the rest of our day our time in Q&A and just our time of fellowship and we have a wonderful time of fellowship even in these dark times we live in father uh, we know it's a spiritual thing we grace believe no this is a spiritual battle we're dealing with with everything out in the world today but nothing is more powerful than your grace and mercy and we pray that upon all of us today. We thank you for all this in Christ's name. Amen.